Well, good afternoon. Welcome, everyone, to our digital identity uh, panel. I'm excited and thrilled to bring on stage our good partner, MasterCard, and one of MasterCard's most senior leaders, Bob Rainey, who is the EVP of Identity Solutions at MasterCard. Uh, the, uh, the panel for today is really an opportunity for Bob uh, to give us his thoughts on digital identity and the partnership that we've been able to work on together. We'll have about 10, 15 minutes of uh, that discussion. And then we'll, I'll do a Q&A to ask Bob a few questions. And then I want to open it up for the audience for participation. So get your questions ready. And at the end, we'll address as many of your questions as we can. The partnership. So a few uh, earlier this year, we uh, launched and announced a partnership for, between MasterCard and Samsung around digital identity. And although we, we're not going to get into all the specifics of the partnership, we do want to give you a sneak peek today on why we did the partnership and what we think the consumer impact can be. The consumer's perspective on this is, imagine you're a consumer uh, where a future where we can give the consumer control over their information, privacy, give them the ability to uh, have a secure identity that can be verified that they are in fact who they say they are, and that identity can be transmitted digitally to sensitive web pages and done so in a way that is seamless and an incredible user experience. And we think we can do that for applications such as bank applications or other sensitive sites. And so we're excited to work, be on the forefront of that innovation. Uh, Bob, as, uh, as EVP of his group, along with his colleague Charlie Walton, who you just heard from, and their CEO, Ajay Banga, have been really leaders in developing a new architecture for how we bring digital identity to market. So we're excited to hear from them. So welcome, Bob to our event. Thank you, thank you very much. So I think what I'll do is probably just um, start out a little bit with um, uh, a, a few slides. We hate, I hate PowerPoint, so I apologize for that in advance. But we're gonna make sure that everybody, when you hear digital identity, you many times uh, have already heard about it from someone else or you think you might know what we're talking about. So I, I just wanna take a minute to ground everybody on what we mean and why this partnership is so important and what the shared vision is. And I, I like this, I like this uh, picture because there's, there's a real you know, compelling moment there about trust. And uh, the slide's entitled Restoring Trust. And, 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 and if you think about it, uh, if I say that we're here to restore trust and we're gonna build a new ecosystem, we're gonna change things, not in a Band-Aid way, but foundationally change things so that we can restore trust in the digital environment, um, you have to also acknowledge that we don't have trust right now, that it's a very broken ecosystem. In fact, we have a crisis of trust. And I think it's gonna be the, one of the biggest challenges of this next generation of technologists to fix this problem. There's a lot of things happened in my world since in the early 90s when I started to be a technologist and try to develop things. We did a lot of things right, but this is one fundamental design problem that we have in the industry that will have to be corrected before we can really move on to that the world that we envision. Um, and, and as far as the crisis of trust, let me kind of put dimension that for you a little bit. It's not just the stuff you see with, you know, your password's broken and somebody's got to send you a link. I mean, I know that's a problem. Uh, it's not just the, the sensational headlines that say, yet another data breach. That There's so many that people are hardened to it and they actually ignore it and have, I think in many ways, just given up. That's not actually the crisis. The crisis is that um, there, what we have missed in this ecosystem of being able to have trust in a digital environment is allowed a lot of crime, confusion, a lot of cost into our ecosystem. And the crime thing is very real. I mean, I know we don't talk about like chasing criminals, but actually they use the financial industry as an ATM. They just withdraw hundreds of millions of dollars from this digital ecosystem. And they use it to fund things like terrorism and drugs and human trafficking. So again, for this generation of technologists, this is a worthy calling, is to help us fix this trust issue. Uh, before I get into that, I just want to say one thing. I, I've used the word design a couple times here, and I, I want to tell you what I think, uh, before, before I get into our principles, what I think the, the, the real issue is. Back in the early 90s, <laughs> which I know you guys were all probably children, um, Back in the early 90s, when we got online and we, did, uh, we worked on the internet at my university, I had one identity. It was you know, Bob Rainey at washu.edu. Um, and all I could do is get on other websites 
from the, uh, and they actually weren't websites, but they were directories at other universities, and I could look up research papers. That was the internet in the early 90s. And if you think that we built this thing to be what it is today, and that we had the c concept of buying things online or doing really sensitive tra financial transactions, we did not. So what we did is we, everyone just kind of let it grow. And now you have how many accounts? Did anyone really know how many accounts? There's, there's other numbers I'll find out there, but a lot of people have 200 accounts, 250 accounts, just different identities with different siloed individuals. And you know what? We can talk about the passwords being a problem. We can talk about the problems with OTP and SMS. We can talk about those. But the foundational design problem is you should have never had 200 accounts. And every time you go to present yourself to a new uh, uh, entity to do business with, you should not have to create yet another account and start over from scratch. So that's the design problem. If we knew what the internet was going to be, we would have designed one strong account or that, you could, that was highly assured, not selfish, or bob at gmail.com. We would have established an account that could be used, that had some strength to it, that we keep secure, under consumer control, and be reusable. And that's what we mean by digital identity. That's the difference, and that's the challenge, is going from 300 accounts down to one. That will be the challenge. If you're going to get into this and you get, you would get some fantastic partners to help you, one thing that you're going to do is have to differentiate, differentiate yourself from those people that are out there already. And there's a lot of identity, kind of pseudo-identity providers that do kind of federated logons and those type of things, but they are not helping. They're actually not highly assured accounts. Uh, they're actually selling consumers data. There's privacy issues. There's lack of transparency. So we, started, we decided to start from a really good place, and that's we developed 10 principles that we wanted to found this new ecosystem, this new network off of. Uh, they're all around the consumer. I'm not going to go through each one of them, but we want to be inclusive. We want to make sure that our digital identity ecosystem allows people to participate in the economic framework in their country or be part of the, the economy. We want to make sure that the consumer is the owner. I, I get into these conversations. Who owns the data? Does MasterCard own the data? Does the bank own the data? Does the merchant own the data? It's the consumer's data. And we've got to start acting like it's the consumer's data. We have to be transparent, and we have to allow them to consent, and we have to make sure that we're doing this the right way. There's also privacy by design with security and integrity, and that's where I think our, our, our partnership really shines in the sense that we're not going to keep this information in a centralized honeypot of data for somebody to compromise and sell on the dark web. We're actually using the technology to develop a new way to do this distributed data with uh, data min minimization and those type of things. So these principles are really foundational for everyone who joins our ecosystem. We, we are going to do this this way. And I got to tell you, um, it would be easier if we took shortcuts, believe me. It would be easier if we stored data centrally. It really would. I could design this thing in an hour. It's been done. But to do it the way we're trying to do it is, is harder but it's the right way to do it. Uh, what am I talking about from an ecosystem? Because right now, the problem is between that user and somebody we call the relying party. If you're, uh, and what I mean by that is the user comes up and they present themselves to a, an organization who's never seen them before. That poor organization is stuck. They want to get my business. I'm saying, well, I'm Bob at gmail.com. Why can't you trust me? What do they do? They go out to three or four or five different organizations, and they, they might check your email address. Has it been known on a bad list? They might check your phone number. They're going to look at static information. They're going to ask me my dead dog's name. You know, what was your dog's your first pet? I got to tell you, my first pet's been dead for 50 years, so <laughs> it's not a very happy thing for me, right? <laughs> um, it's just it's, it's an abomination. And if they get through that whole challenge and they pay the money to do it, it's no good because that data's all been compromised. 10 years ago, right? Uh, so we've, we, these two people are stuck. The consumer wants something, and the relying party would love to do business with them, but has no good way to check them out and really establish a relationship. So that's the problem. And then what they do is they, they create yet another account for you, and good luck managing those passwords, right? Uh, what we're trying to do is create this ecosystem where the consumer has somebody that they already know and trust. For example, we call those trust partners. That consumer's already worked with a bank or maybe they've worked with Samsung, or maybe they've been vetted out through um, a, a mobile network operator. Someone who the consumer knows and trusts and can communicate with that consumer and vouch for that consumer. So the trust partner is like me trying to um, 
introduce Charlie to Sang. I'm, I'm gonna, if, he know, if Sang knows me, I can, I can vouch for Charlie. If they just meet each other on the street, they're not gonna know, there's gonna have no way to trust them. And that trust partner is the one who does the introduction and vouches for that person. And another thing that we're doing that's different is this identity verifier uh, role. A lot of identities are self-asserted, meaning the person's just said, I'm Bob at gmail.com, trust me. Um, and that's not really uh, a sustainable model. Where does your identity come from? It comes from your government, it comes from uh, your bank, it comes from, if I wanna know that what year I graduated from college, shouldn't the college actually answer? If I wanted to know that I have a good account in financial, stand, good financial standing, shouldn't I ask the bank? So identity verifiers have pieces of information about you, and by creating a network effect, we can actually solve this problem. And then lastly, before we get into the Q&A part of it, people, many people ask me, well, what can I use this for? What's the killer use case? And um, so I'm a 25 or 30 year in career in payments, and you would think the first words out of my mouth are gonna be, you can use it to buy stuff. But actually, that's not the killer use case. That's very important, and we obviously have to address that. But the killer use case is that first presentment, that, that moment of magic when somebody says, I want to establish a relationship with this new entity. And helping them onboard that person, helping them meet the KYC requirements, know your customer, helping them meet the anti-money laundering requirements, making sure that that person is really, truly okay to get into the ecosystem, that front door, that's really important. And that's really hard if you're a consumer, you'll be filling out forms and providing things and taking it all that garbage and you know, providing your data over and over again and God knows where, where they're getting it from, that's the problem between both the consumer and the business and that front door is really important. We also get into other uh, use cases that are very interesting like you gotta be over 25 to rent a car, how do I know you're over 25? Do I have to share my birth date? If I share my birth date, then, then the bad guy's got a, yet another piece of information. So the data minimization would be, Bob wants to rent a, a U-Haul truck to move his treadmill which happened last weekend. Um, I, had to prove that I, I had to prove that I was over 25. I actually had to cough up my birth date. I would much rather have them ask somebody, is Bob over 25? They don't really need to know that static piece of information and spread it around. So those kind of things like, um, will be very helpful. Background checks, age verification, getting on an airplane, checking your, your passport without actually having to produce the document, all ideas around how to use digital identity. And I know I went on a bit, but I want to make sure everybody was grounded on what we meant and how different it was from what you're experiencing today. Great. Great, so th thank you, Bob, for the, uh, the introduction. Let me just ask you a few questions and then we'll open it up for audience participation. So the first question is, why is MasterCard on the topic of digital identity? Why is it important to you? And then as a follow-on, why what are the biggest challenges in delivering this service to consumers in your experience? Well, why, it's, why we got involved in a MasterCard comes from a couple dimensions. First of all, we have a huge interest in financial inclusion. As we go into new markets, not developed markets, but developing markets, we find that there's a whole bunch of people that can't even participate in the, the ecosystem. They can't be part of the economy. In fact, they're kind of stuck where they're at from a financial uh, standpoint. So we see that as a global company. And, and we are trying to help bring on the next group of people into the ecosystem. I think we had a goal of 500 million new users in our ecosystem over the last couple of years, and I think we're on track to make that. But financial inclusion is a big issue, uh, and it keeps people in poverty if they can't participate. Uh, the other thing is just uh, payments is not really working as well in a digital space as it does in a card present space. If I give you that chip card, I can verify a cryptogram, and this is, I'm glad I can say this in front of you, this audience, finally people can understand what I mean. Um, we got a cryptogram off that chip, we can verify it. It's a deterministic model, 96, 97% approval rate, yay. We love that business model. You try to do a transaction with a phone or a, your connected car or an Alexa speaker or whatever, pick something, uh, and, and the approval rate, goes way down because we don't know it's you. There's no cryptogram to val validate. So, so our, our core business has is, is got some brokenness in it and that's not MasterCard, that's just the entire digital financial ecosystem. Um, and then, then, then lastly, we think we got a lot to give. Like, like Samsung has a lot of, uh, uh, in the way of technology and leadership and, and uh, consumer reach, 
we have a lot to give in network, how to run a global network, how to bring partners together, how to govern that network, how to, how to make the connections and run a network like that. So we definitely believe uh, we, we, we see the, the, the areas that we need to focus on from financial inclusion, from just making payments work, and then bringing some assets to this problem. Great, thank you. Uh, Bob, what, can you tell us a little bit about why you uh, decided to um, work with Samsung? What the design thinking was with, with regard to Samsung and how you thought through that problem? Right, well we had, it starts with a good relationship yeah. to start with. Um, we, I personally have worked with Samsung for many years, going back to you know the first Iris uh, devices, Samsung uh, Pay. Uh, it's a you guys are, are, are. I'm not trying to use the word aggressive, but you're <laughs> you're you're. If you have an idea, you go after it. Right. There's there, it's 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 it's, a, it's a, not all companies are like that. There's some they're not conservative, right? right? Uh, so we have ideas. We work together. There's, there's an ability to say, yes, we're in, and we and put some muscle behind it from a terms of technology and a terms of leadership and a terms of kind of courage to, to do something new. Um, but the, the technology and the devices and the, the, the size of your market and your reach and, and your influence as, as somebody to start a visionary thing like this was really very important to us. And, and being able to embed things into devices, I gotta tell you, I've spent a lot of my life trying to get people to download things and yeah, that's, that's overrated. So uh, your ability to do embedded work with us is really also very important. Yeah, great. Well, yeah. I'll share with you a little bit from our perspective for the benefit of the audience. Um, we, we started this discussion over a year ago, and in, in that short time, we've been able to announce the partnership and be very close to something we can discuss more commercially. When we, when we heard your design principles around consumer privacy, consumer control, trust, transparency, third parties, we felt that was very much aligned with the way Samsung thinks about the world, which is consumer first, an open ecosystem where we're not trying to control information necessarily, but really give consumers benefits. And so there was an immediate alignment around strategy and kind of big level thinking. And then what, what became very clear after that was we both have assets that neither one of us have alone. So for example, we have hundreds of millions of devices around the world, so it's a massive device footprint. Each of those devices on the mobile side has a trust zone, protected, uh, encrypted container on the chip that contains all of these important credentials for things like payments, identity, Samsung Pass, Samsung Pay. And those, those uh, containers are on the edge. They're not in a centralized st server for a, for a honeypot type attack. And so we, we saw that, and then we saw your architecture design. We realized what MasterCard really has in spades, of course, a proven business model a payments infrastructure that's global, that's working at hundreds of millions of transactions per minute, if not seconds, um, and a proven model around managing all of that globally at scale, we thought this would be a really great combination. So that's how we got together. And of course, a lot of the work, Bob, as you said, around Samsung Pay and the launch and support of Samsung Pay was also a, an interesting and good proof point. Right. So I agree with you. Uh, next question. Uh, what is your view on... Um, why or how what we're doing with digital identity could be potentially relevant um, around uh, payments? Because you mentioned payments is a good use case, but maybe not the first one. Any, can we give a, for our audience a little bit of a deeper view into what that could look like? Well, um, it, so you're gonna have different experiences when you're online. Is digital identity would always be needed, right? No matter what you do, the first thing you have to do is establish that you trust each other. Mm -hmm. So, I feel like that's the very that's the the source of the Nile right. is to actually get to the digital identity, and then you're going to have things that you want to do once you're there, like in the old Unix environment. What, what are your permissions with that user ID? Um, and so, so in this case, payments is going to be an attribute that hangs off of your core digital identity. And we've just um, in, a, in the payments industry created a new standard called Secured Remote Commerce, but it's a way to kind of link the actual. Um, you know, digital identity that we get right with your preferred payment method. And that way, again, the consumer's experience can be very, very uh, friction free. It could almost be, uh, I click a button and I log on and, and at the same time, it already knows, I've already kind of associated my payments uh, credentials with my identity pr 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 credentials. And unless I want to override that, I can just go through the ecosystem. Well, there's other times where you're gonna to wanna to stop and make the payment separately because you wanna think about it or you wanna maybe you know, do something different or you just wanna have that explicit consent 
consent on that piece of the transaction. But we definitely see the two big things that people are going to need to do is um, KYC, know who your customer is, and identify and trust that person. And then the customer is going to want to do things. And obviously, the one place where the, hand, the things are changing, hand, uh, money's changing hands is payments. So it's obviously a great place to start. Plus, we've probably got a bit of an inside track on that one. Great. great. Uh, let, me, uh, let me share with yeah. you a little bit of, um, in addition to payments, where some, the technology could be applied in our services landscape. Okay. So uh, as many of you know, Samsung has a, a very large portfolio of services, Samsung Pay, Health, Samsung Pass. We have internet, we have Bixby, we have IoT. And uh, our view is that for each of those applications and experiences, uh, we can actually make it easier for third-party partners, uh, independent applications and websites, as well as our own homegrown services, our first-party services, to benefit from uh, faster and more secure login, both into the service but also to do downstream work for each of the services. So imagine inside Samsung Pay, or inside health, if you plan to do something beyond just the first screen, how do we facilitate that interaction so that the most important secure credentials are pushed across to those third parties? We think there are a number of use cases, including what you mentioned, Bob, KYC, know your customer. But obviously, there's a lot more that we can talk about. So uh, immediately for us, it has applicable uh, use cases immediately, and use cases that are beneficial for the user, because we have everyone wins. Right. The user gets their security passed securely. Samsung can protect the user's identity and make that experience more seamless. And the third parties can actually receive secure, verified information. So this is one of those situations where everyone wins. Right, and uh, it, it even uh, if there's fraud in whatever ecosystem that you're talking about, you probably reduce that as well. So it, it does, it's a win all the way around. Yep, great. Uh, let me do one more question, and then uh, we'll open it up to the audience. So. Um, the, uh, what, can you share with us a little bit, Bob, on um, what you see, you know, there's, there's a lot of developers in our community, this is Samsung, this developer conference. How can developers work with you and work with MasterCard and Samsung on digital identity in the future? Well, I think, um, yeah, that's a, that's a great question. There's kind of two things. There's a, the immediate is that we are trying to get this thing going, and, and we have some some very great progress in a couple markets that we're working in. Um, but the more people that, that kind of hear the call to action, this is really important. The digital ecosystem is drowning, and we need to make sure that we, we all start to think about this and do the right thing now as far as privacy protection, making sure that consumers are, are uh, not exposed to a lot of fraud. Uh, the what, one way to do that would be to start to go to the code lab area and start to understand what we've already done and see if you can take advantage of that as a right now, get started uh, way to, to kind of get involved with it. Um, in, the, in the future, I would, I would tell you guys not to be hardened to it. Um, it's easy to say, well, my data's out there, it's, uh, I, my privacy, I just don't care anymore. Um, but, but we as a community have to address this issue or our, our community will, will really suffer in the future. So uh, the first things would be get involved with what we have now, take a look at it, see if you can incorporate it, help us improve it, because we're trying to fix a very, very big problem. Okay, great. Well, thank you. Let me open it up to the audience. Uh, do we have questions in the audience? Right here, the gentleman on the left. Can't hear. W would you mind coming yeah. to the microphone yeah. and uh, asking the question? Thank you. Thank you. I wanted to know if you guys had any future initiatives as far as cross compatibility is concerned when it comes to um, like mobile payment systems and stuff like that. Um, just seeing if there are any future initiatives that um, can help protect and secure a digital identity around uh, around mobile payment systems um, when it comes to cross compatibility. I know there's Samsung Pay, but I'm, I don't know if you guys work with any other uh, mobile payment systems or not. But just seeing as how that few, any future initiatives um, as far as like security for other mobile payment systems, I guess. Uh, so let me repeat the question for, for the audience and for Bob. Um, so the question is a two-part question. The first one is, what more can we say about how digital identity, as we're discussing it, can improve mobile payments? And the second question is, does MasterCard work with other mobile payments companies, including Samsung Pay? OK. Um, so right now, in the payments, uh, the payments environment is a four-party model, and I don't, I don't know if people th think about the complexity of that, but 
Um, we have to get information from like 50 million merchants. I'm sure that number's not right, but 50, 60 million merchants, 70 million tomorrow, a lot of merchants, and we have 22,000, 20 more than that, financial institutions. And I'm trying to make sure that they all understand that you are you. Um, and that gets to be a, a, a really interesting problem. So um, getting this, you know, getting your digital identity and being able to get it not just to the merchant who's the one interacting with you at that moment, but actually getting the issuer to understand that you've been validated is gonna be super important. I've seen, I've seen use cases in many markets like in Europe where they have something called PSD2, where you could actually uh, get validated to log into the merchant site, of course, and then the bank wants to know that it's still you, so they're gonna send you a one-time password afterward, and the user experience and breakage is just phenomenal, plus it doesn't work that well. So if we could just do it once really, really well, and then share that information throughout the ecosystem, we could, we could have a much better consumer experience, and I know we would not fraud, fraud out of the ecosystem. And as far as working with other payments uh, methods, I mean, uh, MasterCard is a global company, and we have to work with everyone. Uh, some, some things we do are very low tech, like um, cards, and then other things are, are extremely high tech, like this solution we're talking about, but we're very open to trying, trying to serve the entire you know, consumer global data uh, base of people. So obviously we do work with, with other players. Great, next question please. Um, so I was wondering um, what MasterCard and Samsung are doing in that initiative to prevent uh, fraudsters to create fake identities. Uh, and uh, like, so if fraudsters are able to cre create fake identities, then it kind of yeah. uh, mute. The it's a great question. So, so the question is, uh, what, are, what are we doing to prevent fraudsters from creating new and fake identities? Yeah, that's a great question, by the way. So thank you for that, because um, we've seen some really interesting and, and secure payment methodologies only to be, have them be inundated with fraud because bad guys are really good at signing up for them. Um, so, so one thing about this digital identity thing that, that um, since we didn't demo it, or you should go look at it, but you'll see that enrollment isn't really very easy. Um, but you, I would say you only do it once. So imagine enrolling with capturing your driver's license and interrogating that for the optical character recognition, checking the information on the back, taking that selfie off that, the front of it, doing a facial recognition against it, going up against the DMV database or the TSA database if you're in, in the US, um, checking some info. So imagine a 10 point, you know, uh, three things that the consumer do and seven things that we do in the background to let you establish that base identity. Much different than I'm Bob at gmail.com. There's none of that nonsense, right? So enrollment gets to be multiple steps and we're validating stuff both physically and in the background and we're binding that all together with the biometric and putting it in, uh, you know, this safe trust zone. Uh, so we can keep, the, keep this information safe forever. Um, the enrollment is hard, and you know, we need it to be, because letting people in the front door and then trying to sort them out later isn't working for us. So um, yeah, it's a multi-step enrollment process and it requires some pretty, um, some pretty uh, significant actions, and we do a lot of cross-checking and validation. Great, let's take the next question. Yeah, just timing-wise, what do you think something like this uh, would take to hit the U.S. markets? When would it be available? So the question is, uh, what's the timing on when we can see solutions for consumers? And maybe, Bob, just to add on to that, we can discuss globally what's the rollout uh, thought yeah. process. Um, timing, you, you will start to see this, um, if not at the end of 2019, you'll start to see some things in the very first quarter of 2020. So it will be exist in the market, and you can see if you go in and, and, um, and experiment around with it, you'll see that we're, we've got a lot. Of, we've made a lot of progress in this area. As far as markets go, that's a very interesting question. And, and uh, can I take a second on that one? Sure. Um, it because it is a highly assured identity, and we're worried about privacy and consumer protection and all those things. You can't just say, I've got a global system, let's just roll it out everywhere, right? It actually has to have a link. I said I was gonna cross-check that with a DMV or a TSA or whoever. I mean, just name the entity in your, in your country. Um, so we've gotta to integrate to them. We gotta go through their document verification services and those type of things. That takes a little while. We have to respect their privacy and things like GDPR, which uh, makes us anonymize the data in certain ways. We have to, um, 
we have to, you know, uh, get with the players in the market to enable certain things and make it this thing available. So it will be country by country. In some markets like um, India and Estonia and, and Singapore already have a centralized governmental database that they use, and that might be a matter of connecting them in. And other markets have nothing, and we have to kind of start from scratch. I would tell you that I see the markets that have something called open banking laws, meaning the banks are supposed to now allow access to their, their, their information about the consumer. Uh, those are markets that are needing a solution to recent regulation. And those are markets like Europe, markets like Australia, uh, other markets that are, are um, emerging with this type of uh, change. So those are the markets where you probably see it first, where the regulation has kind of created a fertile ground for us to plant some trees. Yeah, absolutely. And I'll just add, uh, the, the future is verified identity. I mean, verified, the, it's very important just in case the point's being lost. Saying that you are who you are is different from us knowing through a composite of your own attestation as well as a third party verifying that you are who you say you are. It's a fundamental change in the way we do identity and the fundamental way we, identity is transmitted digitally. So it's very much the future. I agree with, with your comments, Bob. Let's take the next question. So, great straight man. So my, my question is, we're really talking about that immutable rooted trust for the digital identity, right? So who gets to decide or how do we collectively agree on who the certification or validation authorities are, one, and then two, get them to agree that yes, they will actually provide that validation service? Let me repeat the question. Um, the, uh, the question is around root of trust, who decides how, and then who's the certificate authority, and how do we decide who, the, who those authorities are? Wow, a very, uh, a very, uh, 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 another great question, and a hard one to answer in the sense that that's gonna probably change in market to market, right? So there's no easy answer to that one. Um, I would say that uh, there are governments that are being active that open up various um, uh, facilities to people that are wanting to try to do this. So their certification process, and that is pretty well defined. Uh, I can just off the top of my head uh, say that markets like Australia have something called the Australian Post that has an identity service as well as a document verification service. So those things are well defined, and we can you know can you kind of use this as kind of a, a centralized place to say, well, if I go through this process, um, I can I can use it as as is Adhar in India, which has got 1.2 billion identities in that centralized database. We don't love that design, but there's some stuff there to kind of root off of. Uh, but in each market, it's going to be different. I think what you have to do is create a landscape of very transparent rules to say anybody who joins this ecosystem, this is what we're able to provide in this market. This is the level of rigor that's going to be involved. This is the test process that we have. We're using things like machine learning to tell you the quality of the data coming back. Like if somebody's giving me a bunch of garbage, I'm going to be able to root that out pretty quickly. Um, but it's a very, very big part of the problem and it's going to vary, vary market by market. So it's a, it's a lot of heavy lifting, to be honest with you. Yeah, and if I could add one, one comment. I, it was an excellent question. I think, uh, you, you know, if, we, if you look at it abstractly, there is no one place you can place all that trust. Right. In, in fact, that's the strategy. It's, you know, if you look at uh, just an example in biomedicine, some of the most advanced retroviral medications are a series of medications that once the viruses are going over so many gates, you can't, you can't, fake your way or, or overcome, you know, you can overcome one or two barriers, but you can't overcome 11 or 12 barriers. And so uh, security is a very similar model, which is you have to place trust somewhere. You might as well try, uh, start with the most established, large right. databases of folks who've done it for decades, right, which are right. some of the companies on stage here. But then you've got to create composites, and, and those composites have to continue to check each other right. with, over time to maintain and verify that trust. And it will be. Uh, go ahead, and that's part of the, I think, architecture of what uh, MasterCard has been working on. It is, because honestly, it, it, it is not the same game in every market. There's more resources to pull off of in some markets than others, and so it's gotta be like that. By, by design, we're gonna do the best we can and be as transparent about it as we can be, but it's gonna be um, an evolving, kind of growing thing. Right. Let's take the next question. Hi, um, I have a question for Sang, uh, for one, and uh, the other uh, could be either of you. Uh, so first one for Sang, um, what was the reason that 
uh, Samsung is proceeding this collaboration with MasterCard over other platforms like Visa or IMAX or Discover? Um, and what was any like competitive advantage that MasterCard pro could provide uh, with that collaboration? Uh, so that was the first question. The second would be, um, is uh, Samsung and MasterCard um, having any plans in terms of like expanding this collaboration with Visa, uh, Discover, or Amex? Uh, because customers are not only using MasterCard, but also like with the combination of different platforms. So um, I, I love this initiative, and I love how it's heading out. But if it can be expanded, I think that would benefit customers a lot more. So the question is, um, and by the way, since it is the Samsung Developer Conference, and we have our guest MasterCard on stage, I will exercise my right to amend the question a little bit. <laughs> it's a very good question. How do we expand and work with other partners, and are we working only with one partners or one approach, is your question. Um, and let me just answer it this way, and Bobby, I'd be great love to, to I'd love thoughts. to help on that one. Um, you know, for us, Samsung is very focused on, for many of you who work with us as partners, you know there's this constant tension with us. We're global. We're hundreds of millions of consumers around the world. So everything we put into market has to be mass market. So if we address a problem for a small sliver of our user base, it's just not big enough for us to bother. So then we have to pass on those opportunities and let those opportunities mature until they become bigger mass market opportunities. So one tension is, is it mass market enough and global in scale? The other tension is, how do we get there first and be on the cutting edge of innovating on behalf of the consumer? How do we put next generation technologies, next generation capabilities in front of our consumers? Because that's why consumers love and trust Samsung, the brand. So that's the tension. And when we had a discussion in the industry on identity and verified identity, we've been studying this problem for years. And we found that after a careful search and careful consideration that a lot of the architecture, design, the principles, the, the third party trusted partners that have been uh, identified by MasterCard really was as a, a, on an overall basis state of the art and really the next generation, the next approach. So for us, it was a, a decision to really work with a partner who had had a proven track record working with us. Obviously a very long, rich, successful history as a public uh, 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 payments company, and uh, it was a matter of just making sure that we were aligned around how we go to market, which was fairly straightforward. Um, so that's the basis of the of the of the partnership, and one that we are uh, very confident in. The question, the second question, is around who else do we go to market with? I think the short answer, and and it's a little bit of maybe not that satisfactory for you, but the short answer is, identity is not going to be solved by any one or one pair of companies. It's a very long-term, large-scale problem. I think what we're excited about is that we're really on the forefront together, really pushing the principles of consumer information, consumer control, transparency, creating a network of trust, and doing so in an architecture that's secure. Uh, we're very happy and excited about that, but there'll be other innovations, and, and the market will evolve over time. And we'll just look at that market and, and approach it uh, case by case. Just, Bob, you have anything else to add? Just a just very short answer. Uh, I know you think of MasterCard as a payments company. This is not exactly a payments problem. This is up the upstream, and and I don't care what you do. I'm the I'm the consumer identity guy. I mean, I do care, but I don't care what you do after I prove it's you. That's actually the biggest problem I have. If you want to pay for something, fine. If you want to get on an airplane, that's also fine. You know, so. It isn't always about payments, and I know it's. I know Mastercard feels like payments only, but this is. We're looking at this not as part of the payment network. Can I say that? That's a separate infrastructure and ecosystem than our payments network, and this is something new that we're doing. Uh, and payments just happens to be something you can tag onto it. Of course, this has to work for all other types of payments, including you know things that you didn't mention. Uh, so it, it's a digital identity play. It's not particularly a payment play. And the other part of it is network, it, leaving people on islands is why this is the problem it is, and that's why you have 300 or 200 accounts, and, and a network is the thing that's gonna solve it. So we want other players that have the same vision and the same leadership and the same assets, or not the same, but other assets to bring, we want partners. Great, let's take the next question. So I was wondering, um, basically, uh, the digital identity space, it's already 
uh, there are other solutions to it. How does, is this, is kind of a consortium with the service providers and you being the identity provider? Uh, and the second part of that question is basically, do you um, have, um, I guess, what I'm trying to understand is how does it, it does it complement the new crop of um, blockchain-based identity, for example, those kind of applications? Could you repeat the last part? Does it blockchain. compromise? Uh, no, does it complement blockchain-based identity oh, um, to be used, or how does it differentiate? I'm, I'm not quite sure how does it work underneath uh, okay. in technical terms. So the question is a two-part question. The first question is how is this um, solution going to be structured? Is it a consortium, for example? Second question is, does the solution compete with or work with uh, technologies such as blockchain? Um, first question on a consortium. Uh, I don't know if I would use that word. It's a network. I would say that this a network has governance rules, data integrity, you know, uh, standards. So a network, uh, obviously the people that help bring this together will have a lot of say on how that network is formed and governed and, and, and those kind of things. So uh, I wouldn't call it a consortium as much as a, a group of uh, leading technology companies creating a network together. Um, the second, what was the second question? Oh, does it have blockchain? Uh, yeah, I mean, we can use blockchain as a, a immutable you know, ledger for the you know, audit of this to happen. Blockchain technology um, is not required to do this, but it's a nice way to kind of create a, a, a great audit function. Okay. So uh, if you're talking about like self-sovereign identity and those kind of things, I, I, I think we, we can always connect as a network to other players, but the intention here is to create something that we're really in control of how this is done so we make sure that the consumer gets what they uh, need. Great, so let's take one more question. Yeah, so just to, on the first part of that uh, last question, uh, are you uh, with the DID, W3C spec, any implementation or verifiable claims from W3C? Okay, the question is about W3C and whether we're part of it, but I've been told by our, our host that we need to wrap this oh. up. So let's do a short answer to that and then we've got to move on. Um, we're working with W3C on many things. I'm not privy to the status right now of what we're doing on, that, on their identity uh, thing, but we, we very much work with them on a, a lot of things in their payment space, so right. I have to check on it. 